Once again, to everybody, a very warm welcome on this beautiful spring day here at Deutsche Bundesbank. Jens Weidmann, the president, is somebody you all know, and you will also know Johannes Beermann, the executive board member, amongst others responsible for accounting and controlling. This press conference will be recorded and will also be streamed live on the internet. The same is true for the Q&A session following the statements. So also your questions will be recorded and streamed, I have to say so, for data privacy reasons for you to be aware of it. And with that, I suggest Mr. Weidmann has the floor. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to our press conference, the annual accounts press conference. Great that you've come in this beautiful spring weather. The annual accounts, the balance sheet is really the essence of a year, 365 days condensed into a set of figures occupying just two A4 pages. Drawing up the accounts also means looking back over past events, events of last year. This is what I'm going to do, but I'm sure you'll also be interested to hear what's going to happen. So developments, perspectives, an outlook, and I'm not going to disappoint you, I hope. So as usual, I will say a few words about the economic activity and monetary policy before moving on to the key points of our annual accounts. And then Mr. Beermann will discuss the elected aspects of our balance sheet giving you more information. Economic activity lost momentum last year in Germany, the euro area, and also around the world, we can say. After fairly dynamic growth in 2017, the pace of expansion slackened at the global level. For Europe and Germany, this translated into weaker stimulus from foreign business. This was compounded by a more subdued activity in the euro area's export markets than in the international environment as a whole. Turkey's economic problems played a role here, for instance. Additionally, however, there were specific developments in Germany in particular. All in all, the slowdown in Europe was far more marked than it was at global level. Euro area economic output expanded by 1.8 percent last year. This is a slower rate than in 2017, however, it is still higher than the potential growth rates according to conventional estimates. In 2018, the German economy grew by 1.5 percent in calendar adjusted terms, which was roughly in line with the increase in its capacity rates. Aggregate capacity utilization therefore remained high. However, the annual average figures mask the slow down in economic growth over the course of the year, especially in the second half. Reports from the German economy have generally been disappointing over the last few months. German economic output even contracted in the third quarter, primarily due to the difficulties with car makers, which car makers encountered with the new vehicle emissions test procedures. And the motor industry took far longer than expected to resolve this problem. Besides this, production in other industrial sectors dipped in the final quarter. And as a result of this, the German economy as a whole remained stagnant during the last few months of 2018. New manufacturing orders stabilized at a significantly lower level, and at the current end, the relevant sentiment parameters are pointing to a pronounced cooling of the business climate. There's plenty to suggest, then, that the dip in growth will continue into this year. As a result, Germany's economic growth will probably lag well behind the potential rate of about 1.5 percent. That's for 2019. So we cannot sugarcoat these facts. But nor do I think we should use them to paint too bleak a picture of the outlook for the economy. The domestic economy depends in large part on the situation in the German labor market, of course. And as before, this market is in excellent shape. Unemployment has fallen, seasonally adjusted, fallen to 5%. 
the lowest level really since German reunification. What's more, employment is constantly hitting new record highs. In December, the number of people employed surpassed the 45 million mark. And demand for labor by enterprises is still high. For instance, the IAB, which is the Institute for Employment Research, reported a new record level last week of around 1.5 million job vacancies. The sustained improvement in the labor market was also reflected in wa wage growth, and this is important for us in terms of monetary policy. Wages rose sharply last year, even after adjustment for inflation. And Inflation was stronger or strongest, uh, the strongest it has been since 2012. Consumer prices, as measured by the HICP, climbed by 1.9%. However, the short-term fluctuations in industry or other sectors have only a minor impact on labor market developments, which are influenced more strongly by the underlying cyclical trend over the medium term. And as a result, the rise in employment and stronger wage growth will probably continue this year. Economic the growth in Germany is solidly underpinned by favorable financing conditions, rising employment levels and increasing wages. Fiscal easing this year will also provide additional stimulus and have done so. In other words, the economy is unlikely to go into reverse. It will probably, however, just not accelerate just as much as in 2018. And this is the most likely scenario that I see at present. Uh, all the same, of course, this outlook is subject to a fair amount of uncertainty. Over the past few months, uh, people have begun to worry, many people have begun to worry even, that increased uncertainty in the economy could curb investment activity activity in particular. One argument is that it might make sense for enterprises to delay investment decisions until they have a clearer idea of the situation. So the optional value of waiting, so to speak. It is difficult to gauge effects like this accurately, although various measures have been pointing to a rise in uncertainty over the last few months. Some of the indicators remain below their long-term average, though, or do not display any close correlation to aggregate output in the past. This uh, suggests that there is no significant dampening influence on the economic activity as present. Even so, uncertainty is always a key issue these days when I talk and meet with uh, entrepreneurs. Perhaps it's affecting business sentiment because it has prevailed for so long. Added to this, there are two political developments with an uncertain outcome, which could really very well end up placing a real burden on the economy. First of all, the global trade dispute still hasn't been resolved, so there is the continued risk that protectionism might spread worldwide and increase there. And what this means is illustrated by the trade dispute between the United States and China. The, according to a model-based analysis by the Bundesbank, uh, the already adopted trade barriers could on their own shrink both countries' respective output levels by about 0.5 percent over the medium term and diminish world trade by 1 percent. And there is still the threat of extra tariffs on vehicle imports. The United States has at least joined China and the, at the negotiating table, and if markets are more open after these talks than they were before, this would definitely be real progress. Then Brexit, this is a second factor of uncertainty. The UK might leave the European Union on the 29th of March, and it's not clear whether this is going to happen with or without a withdrawal agreement. The Bank of England has simulated a large number of different scenarios, which also reflects the wide range of potential macroeconomic effects. If the close economic partnership between the UK and the EU can be maintained, the British economy could actually perform better than is generally believed at the moment. On the other hand, the Bank of England uh, is warning that a disorderly Brexit could trigger short-term trade disruptions and the risk of a severe recession in the UK. Uh, the worst case scenario would be that UK GDP might slump by as much as 8%. And this, of course, would also affect the economy in the euro area and Germany.
Die Deutsche Bankenaufsicht hat schon früh darauf gedrungen, dass German Banking Supervisors early on strongly urged credit institutions to prepare for a disorderly Brexit, and as far as I'm concerned, this has paid off. We believe that the preparations with the institutions have made good progress, and some have even been successfully completed. Most British banks that need a license for their units based in the euro area have received these licenses already, or are likely to do so until and before 29 March, and this will allow them to maintain their business relationships with their EU customers. A total of 16 credit institutions have decided either to relocate units to Germany or to significantly expand their existing business here. Monetary policy next. So the biggest decision of last year was made in December when the ECB Governing Council decided to seize net asset purchases at the end of the year, this decision marks the first step on the long road towards monetary policy normalization. Under the Asset Purchase Program, APP, the Eurosystem purchased securities worth a total of just under 2.6 trillion euros. While net asset purchases may have come to an end, the program itself is still ongoing because uh, the fact that principal payments from maturing securities will be reinvested in full until further notice, and as a result, the total volume of securities on the Eurosystem's book will remain steadfastly high. And it is exactly this stock of assets that gives the program its economic Impact. ECB Council believes that uh, the key rate will stay up until summer 2019, at least uh, at the lower level until uh, 2019 summer. At present, uh, the markets interpret the data situation, believing that the ECB's first key rate interest hike may be delivered later than was anticipated even in early December. So Something that uh, depresses capital market rates, thus supporting financing conditions the, for enterprises. This also shows that our state contingent forward guidance serves as an autopilot of sorts, more or less automatically a triggered a response from the market participants. All in all, the monetary policy in the euro area remains exceptionally accommodative. This is shown by various measures of monetary policy, such as short-term real interest rate or the divergence of Taylor interest rate from the policy rate. At present, they are close to the values measured at the height of the crisis. The next steps towards normalizing monetary policy will depend on how the inflation outlook evolves in the euro area. ECB staff will present their macroeconomic positions next week, and of course, I will leave it to them to say more on the topic. However, it is clear to me that short-term fluctuations of the oil price such as the sharp decline at the end of 2018, as well as revised growth ex expectations for 2019, may have a temporary impact on the inflation outlook. Remember, though, that the ECB Governing Council defines price stability as a medium-term measure, so we would well do to look beyond these short-term fluctuations. As uh, things currently stand, the persistently upbeat labor market conditions and strong wage growth will strengthen the underlying upward price pressure in the euro area. And they, the ECB actually do not want to deviate or compensate for deviations of the inflation rate. At present, in monetary policy, the question is, uh, about the uncertainty. In academic literature, it is usually recommended to be careful if there is uncertainty, if there are different scenarios possible. Then monetary policy should actually take robust decisions and not react too much to indicators. So you don't run in a dark room. But if there are scenarios with uh, severe consequences 
consequences, preventive policies might be helpful as an insurance. This was the case, for example, during the financial crisis, where swift reactions were necessary in order to stave off a deflationary downward spiral of declining prices and wages. But deflation is not a cause for concern at this time. According to our calculations, the market-based probability of deflation, deflation is at a mere 1.5%. While market-based long-term inflation expectations for the euro area may have dipped in recent months, survey-based measures remain in the range of below, but close to 2%. So they are compatible with the definition of price stability of the ECB Governing Council. Risks that should not be ignored also include the adverse side effects of exceptionally expansionary monetary policy. During the financial crisis, we witnessed the way in which the risks to financial stability can affect economic development and ultimately take their toll on price stability too. In all likelihood, the normalization of monetary policy will be a gradual process, lasting several years. From my point of view, this makes it important to continue along this path, should the inflation outlook permit it. And one shouldn't delay it with a view to the financial markets. And in this context, we need to keep an eye on more than just the risks to financial stability, which can build up in a persistent low interest rate environment. Going forward, monetary policymakers' capacity for effective intervention should not be ignored either. If contrary to expectations, there is a significant deterioration in the outlook for inflation, the euro system has a range of monetary policy instruments at its disposal. However, these non-standard toolkits cost-to-benefit ratio differs from that of standard monetary policy. And in this respect, the trade-off between the effectiveness of certain instruments and the side effects may be worse than it was in the past. And thus, it could ultimately leave little room for maneuver. Furthermore, it needs to be clear that monetary policymakers' focus is on safeguarding price stability. In the event of a major economic shock, fiscal policymakers would doubtless also be called upon to take action. Under existing fiscal rules, euro area countries with sound public finances would likewise have the opportunity to do so. Unfortunately, many countries have failed in recent years to take advantage of the low interest rates and favorable economic conditions to sufficiently improve the sustainability of their government finances and to scale back their high debt ratios. So I fear that this has been a missed opportunity to make hay while the sun shines. Failure to comply with the ceilings for the deficit and debt ratios, as defined in the Stability and Growth Pact, has been a far too frequent occurrence. Since the introduction of the euro, participating countries have exceeded the reference value of 3% for budget deficits in just under 40% of all cases. And when it comes to the debt ratio, the results are even more sobering. Euro area countries fail to comply with a limit of 60% of GDP in well over half of all cases. In 2018, too, euro area government debt fell only moderately, in spite of the favorable economic environment and the extremely low interest rates. Only 10 euro area countries achieved a debt ratio of below or at least close to the 60% ceiling. Sound public finances, however, are a key foundation for a stability oriented monetary policy. They are also vital in tackling the substantial foreseeable impact of demographic change. In Germany, the statutory pension insurance scheme in particular is coming under pressure. Right now, the issue frequently at the heart of the debate is the pension level. The consensus previously reached on the topic involved cutting state pensions over time while encouraging the adoption of supplementary private pension provisioning. And in principle, I still believe this to be a sensible approach and would like to caution emphatically against allowing today's high fav highly favorable financial situation to cause us to lose sight of tomorrow's problem. In particular, a sustainable overall concept needs to take account of both social contributions and the tax burden.
Excessively high tax and social contribution rates stunt employment. And in this context, the labor supply is already being negatively affected by demographic trends. In future, the priority thus must be to boost employment. And in view of this, the Bundesbank has been signaling for quite some time that, given increasing life expectancy and improved physical health in old age, it would make sense to further raise the statutory retirement age. If the ratio of time in employment to time in retirement were to be kept broadly constant, this would not put future pensioners at a disadvantage. It would simply mean that static contribution periods are not accompanied by longer and longer pension drawing periods. All in all, I believe that the current basic tenet of the statutory pension insurance scheme, principle of equivalence that is, is the best way forward here. The more an individual pays in, the bigger the pension will be. Social benefits independent of pensions should be financed out of general taxation in a transparent and comprehensible manner. And the same applies, of course, to any top-up of the basic pension, which forms part of the coalition agreement and was recently the subject of discussion. Alongside sound public finances, stoking the engines of economic growth should be right at the top of the political agenda. And in this regard, too, Germany is faced with particular challenges due to the demographic change. The Bundesbank estimates that the labor supply, that is, the labor force potential, will already be in decline as of 2022. At that point, the migration gains will no longer be sufficient to compensate for the effects of aging. In recent years, Labour has supported potential growth by around 1.5%. But one possible lever that policymakers could adjust is the labour force participation rate. By having a higher propensity to work, older people in particular, as well as migrants, can help to stabilize the overall supply of labour. Furthermore, the ratio of women working part-time in Germany remains considerably higher than in the EU average. Better provisions for supervising children or people in need of nursing could promote greater greater supply of labor. Beyond the labor supply, the welfare of our society is vitally dependent on how much each individual worker can produce. In my opinion, the role of the state is to create favorable conditions for private enterprises to offer innovative and consumer-oriented products and services. Not least, competition ensures that consumers and employees can also share in the gains and prosperity that have been generated. Competition for customers leads to lower prices, competition for labor to higher wages. Competition also fuels innovation, as enterprises can, at least for a time, gain an edge over competitors by creating new products. And this widening offering, in turn, benefits the consumer. Open markets foster competition. The European single market is the best example of this. Studies show that prosperity in Europe has risen substantially. For this reason, the state should eliminate competitive distortions and rectify market failures. In the past, however, governmental control and insulation have not proven themselves to be good levers for increasing productivity and prosperity. The state is certainly not the better entrepreneur, and I believe that the size of enterprises is also the result of private sector decisions and market forces. Small and medium-sized firms in particular, with their hidden champions, are one of the strengths of our economy. And they do not owe their success to governmental guidance. Incidentally, this also applies to the awe-inspiring rise of certain international tech companies, which, particularly given their increasing market power, can be a challenge to the idea of competition. And finally, we should not jeopardize the prosperity gains that result from the close economic integration with our partner countries. This also includes international value chains in which enterprises focus on products with manufacturing processes that offer them comparative advantages. The German economy in particular thrives on openness. Last year, German businesses exported goods and services with a total value of almost 1,600 billion euros around the world. This corresponds to nearly half of the country's GDP. The counterpart to the export of goods 
is the export of capital. The level of German direct investment abroad rose in 2016 to around 1,100 billion euro. More than half of this total was invested in our partner countries outside of the EU. This also has positive repercussions for economic growth in Germany. Studies show that investment abroad leads to additional investment at home. Conversely, there were almost 17,000 companies with foreign capital interests active in Germany in 2016. Foreign investors held direct investment stocks, totaling nearly 500 billion euros. The generated turnover of around 1,500 billion euros unemployed 3 million people. Direct investment coming from Germany and coming into Germany are essential to prosperity in our open economy. In sensitive sectors, there may be legitimate security concerns. However, U.S. foreign trade policy in particular shows that the line between these concerns and protectionist motives is not always objective and clear-cut. And, of course, state-owned businesses can distort international competition. But we must respond by strengthening market forces and not by weakening them at home as well. I would now like to move on to our annual accounts. On the asset side, the monetary policy purchase programs were again the key driver of our balance sheet growth, followed by liquidity inflows from other European countries. On the liabilities side, the euro balances of resident and non-resident investors recorded the largest increases. The profit and loss account for the 2018 financial year closed with a net profit of 2.5 billion euros. This is roughly half a billion euros more than in the previous year. This rise is driven by higher interest income due to the negative interest rates on increased deposits. Following allocation to the reserves, we have today transferred the remaining distributable profit of 2.4 billion in full to the federal government. According to the 2019 budget plan, it will be used to finance the budget. With regard to the elevated interest rate risk, we had already increased our risk provisioning in two tranches in the pe previous two years, by 1.75 billion in 2016 and by another 1.75 billion, 1,075 billion in 2017. And on one year ago, I indicated that the third tranche would follow. And on that basis, the Executive Board has reviewed both the scope of our general risk provisions and the Bundesbank's foreseeable risk situation, while also taking into account our current risk coverage potential. As a result, the general risk provisions will be increased by another 1.475 billion euro, bringing the total to 17.9 billion. General risk provisions are traditionally used to hedge against exchange rate risk, but due to the non-standard monetary policy measures, also against default and interest rate risk. The latter are largely a result of the wide discrepancy in maturities. We have very substantial holdings of low interest-bearing assets with very long residual maturities in some cases. Our liabilities, however, are mainly in the form of short-term deposits. With that, I will now hand over to Dr. Beermann, who will provide you with more details on the Angel accounts. And then, as always, we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome from my side as well. I'll just continue seamlessly presenting the financial statements, the annual accounts of 2018 of the Deutsche Bundesbank, a bit more in detail. All of the numbers are also published in the annual report that you got there. And the slide behind me, this gives you a breakdown where you find what. It's uh, pages 45 and 44 and 45. We just put this together in order to be able to explain some of the important details. I'm going to focus on some of the specificities of the annual accounts of last year. First of all, the bottom line here which is the balance sheet of 2018. Total assets here as a result of the monetary policy activities as before continued to grow significantly. In 2018, it reaches a record high of 1.8 
trillion euros. Now, in the past uh, four years, the total assets of Bundesbank went up by 140 percent, one trillion that is. The main reason of this growth, ladies and gentlemen, the main reason for this growth are the monetary policy asset purchase programs. Now, on balance, the stock of euro securities increased by 59.7 billion euros to a total of 571.8 billion. Now, the purchase of German bonds under the PSPP program alone, it began in March 2015, led to an increase by 47.1 billion euros in 2018. The total holdings of these assets now amount to 448.7 billion euros. Purchases under the other two APPs, that's the CSPP and CBPP3, increased holdings by 16.5 billion euros, amounting to 106 altogether. Government bond holdings, as a result of the SMP program, which was discontinued in 2012, decreased by 3.4 billion euros to a total of 14.6 billion euros through maturities. Then, ladies and gentlemen, the second important uh, reason for the balance sheet growth uh, are the liquidity inflows from other European countries which are reflected by an increase of target two claims on ECB by 59.2 billion euros to a total of 966.2 billion. So the target two claims in the past four years thus more than doubled. On the liability side, then, the liquidity from abroad from the asset purchase programs did not lead to an increase in liabilities from monetary policy operations. They even dropped by 37 billion to a total of 572.8 compared to the year-end situation in 2017. Looking at the euro system as a whole, almost one-third of all balances of the banks in the euro system are with the Deutsche Bundesbank. Euro balances of domestic and non-domestic uh, depositors, euro balances of level 3, 4 and 5 liabilities grew mainly because of increased holdings of foreign central banks. They grew by 87.4 billion to a total of 408.6 billion euros. We also had an increase in the volume of banknotes issued by the Bundesbank. So 56 billion is the number here of the increase up to 690.7 billion euros, which is an increase by a total of 8.8%. Something else is interesting here, I'd say, and that's slide, uh, the slide with the adjustment items for revaluations. This one here, a bit lighter, that's 2017, a bit darker, that's 2018 on the left-hand side. These uh, adjustment items for revaluations compared to the previous year increased by 5.4 billion to 118.5 billion euros. Revaluation reserves for foreign currency went up due to the slightly weaker euro, went up by more than one third. Most of the increase of a total of 1.3 billion euros is accounted for by the US dollar. The exchange rate of the Europe vis-a-vis -vis the United States dollar, US, US dollar, uh, dropped from $1.20 to about $1.15. The revaluation reserve for gold increased by 4.1 billion euros. The gold price in US dollars at the end of 2018 was below that of the previous year. But the stronger U.S. dollar then leads to stronger valuation gains. The long-term view of the revaluation reserve for gold continues to show a market increase compared to the beginning of the monetary union. That was 21 billion at the 1st of January 1999. Uh, here, the reserve is now uh, five and a half times as high as at the beginning of 1999. So, we continue with the next uh, slide. 
the profit and loss account 2018, the most important component of the profit and loss account is the net interest income, which uh, clearly increased from 4.2 billion to 4.9 billion euros, which is mainly due to the uh, increased interest income from negative rates. The main reasons are the balances on deposits uh, by banks that went up, as well as the higher euro deposits of other resident and non-resident depositors, and they increased on a yearly average. Because of the larger increase in the risk provisions, as explained by President Weidmann, the net result of financial transactions shows a net expenditure of 1.387 million euros versus 745 million in the previous year. 1,387, to be clear, versus 754. That is what drives up the total assets in the balance sheet. Net income from participating interest, looking at the third segment here, remains largely unchanged at 0.4 billion versus 0.3 billion in the previous year. The monetary income, which are the next two little bars on this chart, have a negative impact of 0.2 billion euros because of the distribution of the monetary policy income and expenditure in the euro system in proportion to the capital share. At the center here you see staff costs which remains uh, almost unchanged versus previous year at 0.8 billion euros. Next is administrative expenses including banknote production and depreciation of tangible fixed assets and that has slightly decreased versus previous year. The profit and loss accounts for the 2018 financial year closes at a profit for the year, if you look to the far right here, to the amount of 2.5 billion euro versus 0 0.0 billion in the previous year. After allocation to reserves to the amount of 0.1 billion euros, which is in keeping with the statutory distribution restriction according to German commercial gain, a co code rather, the distributed profit, as already mentioned, is 2.4 billion euros. As per 31st of December 2018, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. That takes us to the Q&A session. Who'd like to be first? Ms. Scheder, maybe? In the last row there. Do I have to press something? No, fine. Now, provisions for interest rate risks. That was mentioned by you. What do you expect in terms of a rate change? And what about the change of office at the very top of ECB? What, what influence does it have? Now, the calculation for the provisions, the basis for the calculations, that there is no specific rate path that we use, but there is a number of a number of different pathways or paths which can be used to calculate risks and risk parameters. So a specific forecast is not something that I'd really venture into, as you will well understand. Ms. Meyer. Mr. Weidmann, the Federal Cabinet extended your term of office. So what's your comment on, yet, on that? I suppose you're happy. And the other thing, the other question is, you already mentioned interest staying low for some time into the future. Maybe you can give us an outlook for the significance of this for Deutsche Bundesbank. The federal government today, indeed, offered a new eight-year contract, or rather triggered the process that is necessary for this to be offered. So the executive board of the Deutsche Bundesbank will have to actually give their opinion, and the federal president will have to sign it. So I'm happy about this decision. I like to be president of Deutsche Bundesbank of the Deutsche Bundesbank. I feel that it's a very important role also in terms of monetary policy discussions. So I'm particularly happy to continue to be part of this 
part of the monetary policy debate. That's one thing. The second one, that's the question from before, I think, just stated or phrased in a slightly different way, if I see it correctly. Maybe I can answer like this. The markets, at least, do assume that in view of the slightly deteriorated uh, data situation and the dent in the overall business situation, which is more market than was originally expected, the point of the first lift off, the first increase of the rates, has been postponed, or will be postponed. I mentioned this at the beginning. Um, I mentioned the term autopilot in my introductory statement, underlining that the forward guidance does have an impact in so far that uh, markets try to preempt a monetary policy reaction on the basis of the forward guidance, and this has had an effect, decreasing financing cost. Mr. Morshäuser, <coughs> two questions. First of all, Brexit. Now, you actually described the position of the Bank of England. My question, does have the Deutsche Bundesbank have their own position, a scenario for Brexit? And the second question, uh, there have been some discussions concerning industrial policy of the federal government at European level. What's the position of the Bundesbank on that? Brexit. I did describe the scenarios of the Bank of England, or rather the range of these scenarios. Of course, we've also done our own calculations. And I think you can design and set up many scenarios if you want. You can change the assumptions and set up new scenarios. But the, the models are still not very suitable to map or reflect this very extreme scenario. So what we've done, we've tried with our macroeconometric models to confirm the assumptions of the Bank of England and then trying to define or determine what it might mean for the economy in Germany and the euro area. I don't want to go into detail because individual scenarios will not help you as information because they depend on so many other factors. But the, 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 the general result which applies to all scenarios is that Brexit in particular, uh, a Brexit without an agreement, a no deal Brexit will have very significant impacts on Great Britain and Germany will not be affected quite as much. So, so what hap what's going to happen in the UK cannot just be transferred one to one to Germany. But of course, there are different scenarios. So it is in all of our interests to prevent a no deal Brexit. That's one thing. So the extended period or the extension of the period for the discussion process would be seen in a positive light on the one hand, but if it extends the uncertainty, then this is not an advantage. Uh, the second question. I, I try to describe it in a subtle way, as is my nature. Apparently it hasn't worked. I mentioned before that the question, for example, what size a company ought to have really very much depends on economic considerations and not on political, political considerations. That's the way it should be. And I think the best contribution that politics can offer for the prosperity of a country, that the best contribution is to create general uh, conditions, furthering investments, supporting competition in its positive effects. Market failure and competitive uh, distortions, of course, should be fought. That's part of competition policy. So do you see it as a German or a European topic? Industrial policy. So you can have certain concepts in Germany or other things might only be handled on a European level. So, the World Trade Organization, how do we get them 
to act against dumping in certain areas. Also by state-owned companies, after all. How will we make it possible to, to get them to fight that as well? The behavior of state-owned companies that do not act in an economically feasible way, but they just represent state interests. So that's something that's also covered by the reform paper of the EU Commission, and I think we should really join forces here, making sure, or trying to make sure that the multilateral system works better rather than trying to, to engage in industrial policy measures on a bilateral level. That's more promising. Next question. Next question, Mr. Look of Bloomberg. Bloomberg. Please wait for the microphone. Good morning. Mr. Weidmann, you just talked about your expectations for economic growth in Germany for this year. And you said that you see it clearly below the potential growth. So what range would that uh, indicate? What can we expect? There are some institutes that already see it below the 1% threshold. Is that something you also consider possible? And if I may add a second question, Many people claim at the moment that central banks, and this is not just ECB, would run into trouble in the case of a new crisis when it comes to combating or counteracting that crisis. But there's one measure that ECB has not yet adopted, which uh, plays a role in Japan, which is uh, the control of the yield curve. Would that be something that also ECB would consider? And what challenges would that bring about? Answer. If I was to give you a figure, I would have done so. So I deliberately did not do so and only said below and left the rest to your fantasy, so to speak. And of course, I don't want to preempt any forecasts or prognoses which are done at the moment. There are all different kinds of figures mentioned, one and a half and one and anything in between, essentially. And where precisely it'll end up is nothing I'd want to specify right here. And we'll present it to you once we've calculated our forecasts all the way through. As for monetary policy instruments, my baseline is not that of an economic downturn, but rather of an economic dip that is taking a bit longer than expected, a bit of a soft patch, if you want. But at the same time, it is my opinion that the general forces of growth that drive economic growth continue to be intact. That applies to Germany, but that also applies to the euro area, especially the positive labor market and wage developments were pointed out in this context, strengthening domestic demand. So it would be irreconcilable with that kind of position to now start speculating about all kinds of potential instruments to be used, especially since this particular instrument is one that is not yet part of our toolbox and we've got sufficient other instruments available that could be adjusted in the case of an economic development that's worse than expected, which would then, however, have to have medium effects on price development. That would be our objective, after all. Mr. Kutumanos. Thank you. I have a number of questions. Mr. Weidmann, Two would go to you personally. I would also like to check with you the prolongation of a contract decided in the federal cabinet today. Do you see that with two smiling eyes or laughing eyes, or is it one with tears of sadness? Because quite apparently the cabinet, with that decision, might withdraw their support for a potential candidacy for ECB president. That would be my first question. Second question, over the past, when it comes to presidency of the ECB, you also said repeatedly that it's always a political decision too. Now, over the past in the public, you've been heard to say repeatedly 
that you had negative views on the ECB Governing Council's decision, taking a different view from Mr. Draghi's. Do you think if you'd uh, voiced yourself less explicitly, the political decision might have been a different one? And why did you deem it necessary to make such public statements? Because you were of the opinion that this could exert some concrete influence on ECB Governing Council decisions, or rather in order to show to the German public that the German Bundesbank remains uh, the uh, keeper of stability. That would have been my second question. Mr. Weidmann, checking how many more to come. Okay, let me add one more question that which is not of a personal nature. In your annual report, you describe the future instruments or toolbox and uh, you state that you'd like to return to the toolbox that was available and used before the crisis. So that would be against asset purchasing programs and the likes. And it says here demands for a comprehensive change to the framework of action, however, is premature. Now, what else would have to ap happen for you to be in favor of an adjustment of the toolbox? Thank you. Answer. When it comes to adjusting the toolbox, that in itself does not yet constitute anything of value. I mean, change for the sake of change, that's nothing that makes necessarily a lot of sense. And the wording regarding the toolbox was a bit more subtle. The statement was that there are many effects which at the moment make an analysis more difficult whether an adjustment of the toolbox was indeed necessary because we ourselves can exert a certain influence on, say, the functioning of the markets, the low interest rate environment. Since a lot of transactions of businesses run through our balance sheet and not so much through the capital market, all of that makes it more difficult to answer the question as to whether the monetary policy instruments have to be adjusted. And the statement in that box you quoted is in an environment so much still characterized by the crisis and its effects, let's not perpetuate emergency measures now prematurely, but let's rather analyze very carefully once we've returned to normal market conditions as to, or rather, if and whether we need to adjust our instruments. At the end of the day, the question is whether the instruments help reach the objective and not everything that made sense in times of crisis needs to become a regular monetary policy instrument or even is suitable as regular instruments. And I'm taking your questions in the reverse also, as you will have noticed, and I'll answer the second question now. First of all, I think diversity of opinion in any decision-making body is a positive thing. Because if we all were always of the same opinion, then we might as well stay at home. Follow-up question without microphone. Mr. Weidmann, we can make this a bilateral discussion later. Mr. Best, please, this is a press conference. Let's not make it into individual interviews. Mr. Weidmann, if you let me finish, I'll come to the point. At the same time, during a crisis, given the instruments, given the uh, bond purchasing program, for example, very fundamental questions were addressed which have a far-reaching effect also as to, for example, what actually is the mandate of monetary policy? How narrow is it? Are we crossing the border between monetary and fiscal policy? It's no longer a regular monetary policy discussion and wasn't one such discussion whether to raise interest rates at this week or at the next monetary policy meeting. Something like this has a tremendous effect on the question of the independence of monetary policy and also the acceptance acceptance of the joint monetary policy within the currency union. And with such fundamental questions, which were discussed publicly at any rate, it was something that not just I spoke about publicly, but because it was a subject of public debate. And I would expect that the president of the Deutsche Bundesbank has an opinion on this, which he words and voices accordingly. And I did so because I believed it was important. And I continue to be convinced that uh, bond purchasing programs, for example, can only be an emergency instrument and not a regular one, because the currency region is very different from, for example, the US or Japan. We are a currency region with a single monetary policy, but with 19 different independent fiscal policies. 
difficulties which were tried to address in the EU contracts and treaties, but that is something I believe we ought to discuss in public, which I believe rather promotes acceptance of single monetary policy rather than undermining it. Now, as for future personnel decisions at European uh, level, you will have to ask those who are actually are supposed to make such decisions. That's political decisions depending on a great many factors. And in my opinion, we haven't yet reach the end of any discussion, aren't even close to it. So you may ask the federal government to confirm your statement, but I haven't heard anything to that effect. It is clear the CDU-CSU group uh, is supporting one of their candidates to run as the president of the EU Commission. And it's quite understandable that it's a very important European office, and at the end of the day, it's weighing the political options, something which the federal government has to do. So, with that in mind, I am nothing but pleased that my contract was prolonged, or rather renewed, for another eight-year term by the federal government. Mr. Wahlmeister, please. Mr. Weidmann again, another question concerning the forward guidance of ECB. You said it's like an autopilot pilot in the way that it works, and you sounded quite satisfied about this. Is this the right interpretation? Or can I also say that an adjustment of this forward guidance is not considered necessary by you because it's going to work anyway, being on or serving as an autopilot? Then general risk provisions. You mentioned this at the beginning. You said the year before you had announced a further increase, but not today. So may I take this to mean that uh, you assume that general risk provisions do not have to be increased for this year because the APP has also been completed, so this path is closed. On the last question, yes, that's exactly the way as you say it. Last time I explained that we wanted to step up the general risk provisions in three steps. We've gone through these steps, there's not going to be a fourth one, which does not mean, of course, that we once more will always check the risk situation and the risk cover funds available. So it doesn't mean that general risk provision provisions will stay at this level forever. We we do control, check and monitor this every year, but for the foreseeable future, we do not see any need to act. So, that was the second question. The first question, forward guidance, but the wording, beyond the summer, you said, or at least as long as necessary, that, that there might be some time where we have to change the wording. But you're right in so far that, as far as I'm concerned, I don't see any acute need of action because the markets have understood what we want to express and they have reacted or do react accordingly. Mr. Klinsing, right in the middle here. Mr. Weidmann. Now, you've really been a very strong proponent of market economy forces, which is against the trend in our Ministry of Economics right now. And no, I don't know what the trend is. Well, there is a trend anyway. In the annual report, you also are very critical about your environment and the monetary policy you mentioned that they might lead to a crowding out effect in the financial markets. So h how big is the danger or what kind of damage has been caused already? That's question number one. And secondly, you very often mention the term normalization of monetary policy, but we've got the TLTRO program, which is always a bit below the radar of things. But 47 billion euros are quite something and a, an extension is being discussed presently. What about your idea there? Should it be extended or should we also go towards normalization there as well? 
First question. Now we have this one box that you refer to about this question. The functioning of the work, the markets being impaired or not by special measures. So the answer for us would be yes. But then, of course, financial stability also comes in, and we keep mentioning that. The low interest environment, the low rate environment, in the long run leads to a situation that the willingness to accept risks goes up. Financial market prices re reflect this, and this might become a risk. There are studies in the meantime that point to exactly this, stating that this particular environment also might have an impact on growth scenarios. So there are risks that we have to analyze closely and in detail, knowing also that the efficiency and effectiveness of monetary policy will decline rather than go up over time. And this is what I mentioned or meant. Now, one tool has been mentioned by you, and I think you discuss it more than we do, the TLTRO, TELTRO. And here again, I think there is one question that you need to answer. First of all, an instrument that's been used or adopted during a crisis in a certain context, does it make sense to perpetuate this instrument? The environment at the time was completely different, but you might remember lending was at minus 2%, so in the negative range. Today, however, with all of the fluctuations that we have in the course of months, we have a much more positive uh, situation for lending, credit growth. We are at about um, slightly below 4%, so the situation is different from before. At the time, we had some discussions of possible deflation scenarios. And I think this is negligible, negligible today. And well, we've reached a completely different point in the monetary cycle. The baseline, we mustn't forget this, is a continuation of economic growth or decontinuation, so political normalization, and of course the risk of side effects might go up over time. So. When discussing this at the ECB Council, we have to take a look at how this is to be designed, because changes are possible. Maturities are terms, for example. Now, our objective has to be that at the end of the day, at the, day the markets can take over their roles again, that they can function, and we shouldn't take the place of the capital markets. So the periods or the terms are important. And then, of course, the question in how far some long period of the instrument here might be in contradiction with the forward guidance. Volumes, if we keep pushing volumes ahead of us, with every discontinuation, of course, we'd have effects. It doesn't make sense. And then, shouldn't we reduce the volumes in order to support the banks financing themselves uh, in the private capital market? It's also something that we mentioned before. There's also the element of some, some subsidy or support aid here, so we should be very careful and make sure that the opportunistic participation in this type of operation shouldn't be supported too much. Now, the people just jump the bandwagon. And what about rate or interest rate conditions? Because of the different phase here in the monetary policy cycle, we've got fixed rates that we agreed on. And if we are moving towards the normalization, does it still make sense, or would that really undermine the monetary policy transmission process? Gentlemen in the middle. Two questions. Mr. Weidmann, you said that countries with some fiscal uh, latitude would also need to come in if there was a more market downturn. Are you talking about Germany? Or do you refer to other countries? That's one question. And the second question, you also mentioned that we might have to discuss 
whether preventive action is necessary, hedging against risks. And then you said that when it comes to unconventional instruments, we've got a deterioration weighing the different options. And with the TELTRO, you also said, TLTRO, you also say that you've got some concerns. No, I just said that I discussed the way in which it is set up. So is that what you meant when you mentioned other instruments that would also be available, TLTRO or others? It's not just TELTRO. We also have our forward guidance that we adjusted. So there are lots of different instruments that are used, and of course there are, they could be adjusted or adapted. Concerning the uncertainty, I wanted to just explain the two different views that exist. One being, okay, if there is uncertainty, I tend to be more cautious. And the other one, the other one that, that says, okay, if there is uncertainty and if there is the probability of a doomsday scenario, then I really have to go into things and be very active. But I also try to explain that my opinion is that with the present situation where we, we, we don't have one doomsday scenario, one disastrous scenario where we have to take countermeasures, but we just have a situation where there is a lot of uncertainty and we should be careful in our actions. Jay Powell basically said the same thing just recently or these days, concerning the fiscal attitude. Now, if I remember correctly, we also had this discussion last time. So, after all, Germany has been asked time and again to start fiscal spending in order to support other countries. I'm, I'm not really very much in favor of this because empirical, res empirical research shows that the effect of a German increase in spending, the impact on other European countries will not be very, wouldn't be very big. I refer to the national situations of the different countries. When you have a situation where monetary policies are on the zero level, is on zero level rates and needs to take up unconventional measures, then fiscal policy is a more effective instrument. They got two different jobs, two different mandates, things to fulfill, but with the present situation, fiscal policy might have a bigger role than otherwise intervening to a certain extent, and that's the point that I wanted to make. Not really for some fine-tuning of uh, business situations. I just uh, referred to an unexpected breakdown or dip. Thank you. I'd like to talk about the German banking market. Just a few days ago, we discussed that the profit guidances or profit calculations were about how profitable is the market of the Bundesbank and of ECB, arrived at rather different results. So which figures are correct ones? Which ones should we use? And then we hear from the boards of large German commercial banks that it's hardly possible in the German banking market to come up with uh, good returns. I'm not going to ask the merger question, but maybe you have an opinion on this, whether the German banking market makes it impossible for privately run or commercial banks to generate returns and a profit and whether that might not be a problem from a national economy point of view. Essentially, when it comes to discussing figures, the answer for you should be that the picture remains the same, and the picture is that the earnings situation of German banks is under pressure from different angles, really. On the one hand, it is the low interest rate environment, which means that for those banks who are in the classic lending business are under substantial pressure because the flat yield curve means that margins in the interest rate and lending business go down. And at the same time, German banking market is characterized by substantial competitive pressure as well. Now, from a wealth fair point of view, if you want, it's not just negative. If you're a customer, you're, of course, happy about banks in competition. But it is an issue when it comes to financial stability, especially with those banks 
which aren't active, can't be active on the capital market, but rather have to um, strengthen their capital base from reinvested profits. And that's a topic we investigate time and again also with our low interest rate environment survey. We've uh, added uh, figures, have substance and foundation that in lasting phases of low interest rate that is quite a burden on the banks. But like with diverse sickness, there can be a relatively quick reversal of such a situation which can also lead to substantial problems. That is something we've addressed and that also plays a role in addition to the increasing readiness to take risks in the discussion surrounding the use of macroprudential instruments. Mr. Chalik, next, please. I have two questions. First, since you are also a banking supervisor, I would like to ask whether you see some industrial logic behind the murder of large banks, and if so, what that would be. And secondly, I'd like to know what's, whether you share some analysts' estimates that the best times of the banks are essentially over, because we've got this economic dip at the moment, provisions for credit risks will be going up, interest rates will remain low. So what's your outlook for the German banking market? Is it getting any worse or maybe a bit better? Asking me as a supervisor, you shouldn't really expect me to comment on any individual banks that are under my supervision. But your question was more of a general nature in very abstract terms, if I got that correctly. And in that way, I've already answered your question, if you want, because from our point of view, what counts is that mergers result in banks, and those banks at the end of the day need to have a sound and solid business model. That is what matters in terms of banking supervision and also banking stability. The business model needs to be sound. That's that. And in that respect, it would be desirable that those uh, talks happened because of some uh, economic uh, considerations and make sense in economic terms and not uh, because of political intentions. Now, your question regarding the long-term development of the German banking market, I don't want to go into any details regarding forecasts or expectations, but you mentioned one thing, the rather good economic situation may mean that regarding provisions for loan losses we are going to change in addition to our regular scenario, which is monetary policy normalization, which then would obviously also have a positive effect on the revenue situation of banks. And let me add one more thing. I would want to contradict the impression that the economic situation is anything like a dip or a recession. Your question kind of implied that. Because on the baseline, at least the one that I refer to in my statement without giving any figures, we expect a continued growth. Mr. Siebold. Mr. Siebold. I have a slightly similar question. Mr. Schleweis, the president of the German Savings Banks Association, recently talked about plans for a central bank of the savings banks, the German Sparkassen. What do you make of such plans? Does it make sense? And what should it look like? Yeah, let's leave it at that. Here the answer too. As somebody in charge of banking supervision. You do not seriously expect me to comment on in individual banks or merger plans and comment on those. At the same time, you can answer your question yourself from what I said previously. Competitive pressure is one key factor in Germany, and consolidation in the banking sector might contribute to supporting and strengthening the revenue situation for banks. Whether this would necessarily mean that the customers uh, applaud such developments, that's another matter. Ms. Rando, in the front, please. Mr. Weidmann, two questions for you. First, coming back to Teltros, you explained very nicely which would be the points that you'd uh, want to address or discuss. 
I was kind of missing the conclusion from that. Would you now see a need for issuing a new liquidity instrument also of a long-term nature? That was my first question. And second question goes to the economic outlook for Germany. You continue to sound rather optimistic, especially given that there are some forecasts indicating that in the Eurozone only Italy will show a slower or weaker growth than Germany and that Germany will be below the Eurozone average. And I'm beginning to wonder now where those two storylines are going to coincide. Weak outlook in terms of figures and still very optimistic statements yeah. from you. I think those will coincide or can be brought together via thinking of maturities. There is a growth dint or dip that will continue over the next year. And there's a growth rate that is clearly below the growth potential or growth potential assumptions, but will continue to be clearly positive. As monetary policymakers, for us, the medium-term perspective is what matters. And when we say dip, that already indicates that it will also turn upwards at a certain point. So the factors contributing to it picking up again will be the will be the predominant ones at the end. That will explain this position, which is somewhat difficult to communicate. There can be growth that's slowing down, but at the same time, and this is no crystal ball now, at the same time, there's no reason to doubt the medium-term perspectives, or there are no sufficient indications to question those medium-term perspectives. That would be the solution. And as for the Teltros, I believe there would have to be a monetary policy reason for them. So the question would be whether the banks find it more difficult to fulfill regulatory requirements. That is something that must not play a role in our monetary policy decisions unless it has an impact on medium-term inflation development. And not at all what should concern us is the effect on individual banks. So the discussion yet to be had at the ECB Governing Council, I believe, should be about what will be the effect of those transactions expiring and the effect regarding our objective of reaching an inflation rate of below but close to 2%. Mr. Plicker, please. Mr. Weidmann, thank you. You've mentioned it a number of times briefly. The phase of low rates might be a bit longer than originally expected. You kept mentioning this. The longer these low rate phases last, the bigger the risks are. Maybe you can give us some, some clear picture of that. What are the risks that you see increasing? might even get a situation that it's going to be difficult for ECB to substantially increase the key rate. Well, so what would it mean for, for the banks, for the general economy, business and industry, but also monetary policy as a whole? That's one question. The second question. So eight years as the president of uh, the Deutsche Bundesbank, looking back on these eight years, what have been the pleasant things? Maybe you could focus on one particular one. What's been the nicest thing during these eight years? And maybe what, what's been the most horrible thing in these eight years? So the, the, the most beautiful thing is that I can be with you every year discussing things with you. That's obvious. No, but on a more serious note. Now, these eight years have been years with lots of different developments. If you remember, the crisis, the debt crisis of the states, that's when I started my office. We had really very intensive discussions where Deutsche Bundesbank played a very important role. Now, monetary policy is what we do. Uh, and we, we actually had to go into uncharted territory. That was quite a big challenge at the time, eight years ago. And all in all, we can say, eight years heading an institution with very interesting 
employees and staff members that I like to discuss matters with. And, well, it's been intellectually stimulating, so I can say it's been eight good years in spite of crisis. And with all of the emotion, I forgot the first part of the question, the low rates. I think there are different topics that need to be discussed. One thing that we've kept discussing are really is the, the impact on asset prices. So looking for returns, these low rate scenarios lead to market effects and at times, of course, monetary policy wants that, but they need, you get asset prices that might have to be corrected. That's one thing. And then there is something else that you need to see, and that is that uh, for, for, for quite some time we've had really high growth rates, full utilization of capacity, maybe overutilization in Germany even. So with all these low rates for quite some time. And that's also an environment where cyclical risks in the finance system tend to build up typically. The risks, for example, might be underestimated in the perception of people. If you only familiar if you, if you only know positive times and, and, and upswings and the downturns are not something that you experienced, this might lead to certain attitude. We have to be aware of that. So there are new vulnerabilities that are created this way. It's not so much about uh, monetary policy, it's about the low rate scenario in a long growth phase. Mr. Vikorsky, please. And Mr. Schröers, right after you, both of you asked for the floor. Dr. Weidmann, in the annual report, the Deutsche Bundesbank states significant cyclical risks in the German finance system. You mentioned this in your presentation, and you say, for macroprudential reasons, there is the need to act. What kind of uh, action do you see necessary, and how is it really executed or implemented, or should it be executed? So that's a discussion that we still need to uh, have on the AFS. I mentioned the analysis before. It's connected to the discussion that we had before. So the structurally weak profit situation, and in how far macro prudential or supervisory instruments can help to create sufficient capital buffers, which then can be used in times of crisis. So typically, this leads us to counter-cyclical capital buffers and the discussion of them, which is something that still needs to be discussed by the AFS. In talking to the banks, Oh, I think some of them might even like it, because it's really an element that they can use when discussing the situation with their shareholders. So getting rid of some of the pressure of uh, not retaining profits, but rather retaining profits for the better capitalization of the bank. Mr. Schroes, then. Thank you. Two questions again. We've quite... Uh, We've, we've discussed the Teltros quite a bit, but then investment rates and the negative rates at present. Now, in how far would a zero rate support banks and lending then? So, as an economist, can you follow that? Can you also support this? That negative rates or potential problems for banks and thus also for lending by banks. And the second question, if I understood it correctly, in your introductory statement, you very much emphasized that the governing council of the ECB does not actually look at uh, targets that were missed in the past. That reminds us quite a bit of the discussion in the United States, the average inflation targeting. So are you already trying to determine something here? Are there discussions by the governing council that in future one might go beyond the target because four years in the past one had stayed below? You're right. The answer is you're right. So this was really anticipating a discussion, if you want, that has already started. So 
I stated my position, that is right. And on the first question, the strengthening of the earnings power of banks, this is not the job of monetary policy. So we shouldn't focus on monetary policy to make sure that banks can lend properly and give credits so we don't get letters of gratitude if the situation is like that. So price stability, that's what we need to focus on. You also mentioned the, the, the effect on, on lending. At present, and I mentioned this a minute ago, there is no weakness when you look at it which means, well, the, the reasoning that, that is something that I can't really follow. So negative rates and lending, there's a different relationship then. So the idea was that of a hot potato, and the reason given was also to contribute to stronger lending. And now to actually turn around and look at it in a, well, you need to be very flexible to have that attitude. Ms. Schede? So you've got one opportunity, the opportunity for the last question. To ask the first one, you can now ask the last one. Mr. Weidmann, you said the open discussion of uh, bond purchases, APP, uh, promotes the acceptance of monetary policy. My readers see it differently. Okay, this thing should be changed on the governing council. What do you say about this criticism? And the new ECB president, whoever it's gonna be, what would he or she need to do in order to get more acceptance, a wider acceptance. I'm not sure whether you ask your readers online, which is interesting. That's also interesting in a press conference. It's really like uh, citizens' uh, office hours. No, no, but I mean, there's no contradiction. An open discussion of the risks and side effects of measures is something that would, would promote the acceptance of monetary policy, not ignoring them, that is. And the, the other thing is, with this type of positioning on the council, the governing council or outside, what can be done with it? And you know that the SPP is completely different from the other uh, APPs, also because of the critical discussions, led not just by me, but also by other we members of the governing council. So there is no communalization of the liability in that program, and that was one of the main points which led to joint liability, blurring the borders between fiscal and monetary policy. We buy German bonds, the Italians buy Italian bonds, etc., etc. So not forceful, so forth. So joint uh, communal liability is reduced significantly, and that's one of the essential points, or is also the discussion that we had on the ECB governing council. Your readers, I think the complaints there, will probably rather focus on the low interest rates and not on the features of APPs. So we are not really starting or tackling the short end of the market, which is usually done elsewhere, and just leave everything to supply and demand in the market, but rather use the crisis instrument, instruments uh, in order to influence also the maturity situation in the capital markets. And that's also the result of these programs. So there's been a basic change in the setup of the program here, and uh, the BSPP has got very important elements, for example, the limits, limiting certain risks, and therefore a controversial discussion is very important in order to get a good result. You had a second question? Sorry, no microphone. The question cannot be heard by the interpreters. The acceptance 
of a single currency. I mean, it's not all that bad when you look at the surveys and the results there, how the population feels about it. It's not just in Germany, but also in many other countries that there is a majority in favor of this single currency. At the end of the day, I think the important thing is that ECB presidents always have to make clear that the issue banks, the central banks, are independent, that they only focus on price stability and nothing else. So there must be no doubts about that, and that certainly strengthens the credibility of monetary policy. So there are no further requests for the floor to the gentleman here. So thank you very much and enjoy the remainder of the day.